Let's take a look now at the consistency condition which correlations should satisfy. To understand this topic, what I'll use is let's say a set of random variables. Let's say there are n of them. So for this set of random variables, let's call them x1, x2, all the way till xn. Let's assume that I am sort of quantifying the dependence structure between these variables via the correlation. It means that the correlation is a measure of linear relationship and I am assuming that the dependence between each of these random variables is like a linear dependence. Okay, So how many correlations would there be? For every pair of this set of random variables, there will be a unique correlation between them. So x1 and x2, let us say their correlation is rho 1, 2, x2, x3, let's call it rho 2, 3 and so on. Okay. If you were to arrange these correlations, let's say in a matrix, you create what is called a correlation matrix. What sort of structure does this matrix have? I'll highlight three points about it. The first thing which you have to note about this correlation matrix is the fact that it is an n cross n matrix. Remember, I'm talking about n assets whose correlations I'm trying to model. These assets, again, one more thing I should highlight here. The volatility, if you remember, was for the returns of the asset. Same way, correlation is between returns of these assets, not the prices. So the correlation matrix, which I have in front of me, first things first, it is an n cross n matrix, number one. Number two, how do you read any correlation? Let's say I talk about this guy, row one, three. Row 1, 3, I would read it as the correlation between asset 1 and asset 3, right? This is the entry on in the first row and the third column. So if you were to then read, therefore, the entries on the diagonal, what would that entry be? That entry would be the correlation between asset 1 and asset 1 or the correlation of an asset with itself. So that correlation would be 1. So therefore, on the diagonal of this matrix, you have all ones. That's the second thing to note. The third thing, so it's second thing is all ones on the diagonal. The third thing to note about this correlation matrix is this fact that it's a symmetric matrix, which means that if I look at this entry, this is between the third asset and the first asset. Right. So therefore, instead of writing it as row 3, 1, I have written it as row 1, 3, because it doesn't matter whether you are talking about correlation between the first and third or third and first. It's the same number. Right. So that's why it's a symmetric matrix. Row 1, 3 is the same as row 3, 1. Right. These are three things that I've, I, I highlighted about the correlation matrix. Now, Analogous to the correlation matrix, there is one more matrix that we can work with and that matrix is what we call the variance covariance matrix. To arrive at that matrix, what I use is this vector of individual volatilities. If I have n assets, there would be n standard deviations or n volatilities. Now, this variance covariance matrix, let me denote it, let's say, with this letter called capital sigma. This correlation matrix, how does the entries of this matrix look like? Again, it is a matrix which is n cross n. On the diagonal, you have variances. Similarly, as you had ones on the diagonal of a correlation matrix, you have individual variances on the diagonal of a variance covariance matrix. On the other uh, points of this matrix or other places of this matrix, you would have the covariances and that too this, this is a symmetric matrix so sigma 1 2 is the same as sigma 2 1 so i have written sigma 1 2 sigma 1 n is the same as sigma n 1 so again i have written sigma 1 n each of these covariances i can write it as rho 1 2 i mean let's do it for sigma 1 2 it would be rho 1 2 times sigma 1 times sigma 2 this is my variance covariance matrix okay now, after having defined or how these matrices look like for the multi-asset case, let's come back to the consistency condition, which I was talking about. The consistency condition basically states, written in a very mathematical way, 
that if you were to let's say write down this number this number is a multiplication of three matrices where is where w think of it to be like a weights kind of a vector okay it's a weights vector let let it be an n cross one vector which means it has n rows and one column right so this is how a w vector would look like take its transpose and do this matrix multiplication w transpose times the variance covariance matrix times the weight so let's check whether it's correct or not so w is n cross 1 if you take a transpose it becomes 1 cross n this sig sigma is n cross n if you multiply the two you get a 1 cross n right n and n removed so you get a 1 cross n multiply again with w w is n cross 1 so n and n removed you get actually a single number if you do this multiplication and we are saying that this single number which you get should be a positive number or at best zero number okay so if this number is non-negative we call this variance covariance matrix as a positive semi-definite matrix right and this condition is called positive semi-definiteness condition why is this required this is required because intuitively this step is like I am investing in these many units or these many you know fractional dollars into various assets right I am let's say dividing one dollar into these assets by these weights now if I have to compute the let's say variance of my portfolio I would compute it using this formula that can hold for now we will come back to it when we do portfolio theory but we are just saying that if this matrix is positive semi-definite then the variance which we arrive at for our portfolio would not be negative and we know that variance should not be negative right so this is my condition of positive semi-definiteness uh, barring this mathematical way of defining positive semi-definiteness let's now look at uh, a more intuitive way of defining it right so an intuitive way would be let's take a look at a correlation matrix which i'll tell you that is not positive semi-definite let's take a look at why look at this entry look at this entry and look at this let's look at the three entries of this correlation matrix what is this correlation this is a correlation between asset 1 and asset 2 this guy between asset 1 and asset 3 this guy between asset 2 and asset 3 right so look at what these numbers are telling us a 0.9 correlation between 1 and 3 is telling us that assets 1 and 3 are highly correlated they're not perfectly correlated but they are highly correlated so when 1 goes up then on an average 3 also goes up look at this 2 and 3 also 0.9 which means when 2 goes up on an average 3 also tends to go up right so if this is the behavior between 1 and 3 and 2 and 3 you would expect to have a similar high correlation between 1 and 2 right but the correlation in between 1 and 2 is 0 right which means that 1 and 2 if 1 goes up 2 can go anywhere right it doesn't mean 2 goes up right you can go down also so this behavior seems inconsistent and if you were to do this step the mathematical step with this correlation matrix you would definitely not get a number which is greater than or equal to zero okay so this is how you describe a lack of consistency of a correlation matrix in more intuitive terms now let's finish this topic with a quick discussion about how do you ensure positive semi-definiteness to ensure positive semi-definiteness you need to check two things first thing is when you compute your correlations try and use the same data points to compute your covariance and your two standard deviations right data points are basically the look back window which we work with try and use the same data points and try and use the same weighting scheme right this i have already mentioned to you in the previous video if you are computing your covariance using ewma please do not use standard deviations which come from garch right so do not mix approaches